This week on the RV Podcast, how to find a mobile RV tech to handle your repairs and maintenance needs. And the National Park Service's insistence on using a credit card for entry has resulted in lawsuits and lots of pushback from people being turned away from entry because they wanted to use cash to get in. And what it means if someone leaves a toy frog on your RV or a rubber alligator or a flamingo. The best way to hang photos, towel racks, and other items on the walls of your RV without pounding a nail through the wall. All this plus the RV News of the Week and your questions coming up in episode 489 of the RV Podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Wendland, and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer. And hello, Michael. If uh, you've ever been frustrated getting repair or maintenance service for your RV, our interview of the week in this episode is one you'll find very helpful. We'll talk to an expert on how a mobile RV tech can come to your rescue and why that's a service RVers are turning to more and more these days. Well, spring has officially sprung. Winter is history. It's springtime. And as we have been traveling around Florida and the Gulf Coast this past month, we have been seeing a lot more spring break RVers coming down into the area Spring weather is very much here. The trees are budding. There's pollen. We're sneezing. (laughs) Flowers are blooming. And the warm weather is a hint at what is now slowly making its way up north. And we're in the midst of a long-term project that has us testing camping in a number of different Class B RVs. And we're working with Nick Schmidt and his crew at Sunshine State RVs. We're right now testing out the fourth of what will be five different Class B camper vans. Now, so far, we have tested 20-foot-long models, 22-footers, 24-footers, gas models, diesel models, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive units, and right now we're in a 4 by 4 And we've been in models that are built on the Promaster, the Ford Transit, and the Mercedes Sprinter chassis. And when we are all done, we'll have very detailed, in-depth reviews of each model, showing what we liked and what we didn't like, and eventually picking a winner. It's going to be hard. It will be hard. We uh, will release a video a day on this in a single week next month. So stay tuned. Now, we're doing this because so much has changed in Class B RVs which continue to be the most popular motorhomes being sold today. There have been a lot of technology and design changes since we last had a Class B, which was about five years ago. And um, those changes have been very impressive. And thanks to Sunshine State RVs in Gainesville, Florida, for providing us with the models to test. We can't wait to share our findings with you. Meanwhile, have you visited our new RV Lifestyle community? Uh, The group is growing daily, and we couldn't be more excited. The RV Lifestyle community is a very friendly place where you can connect with fellow RVers to share tips, ask questions, share your enthusiasm for camping. We have organized a whole bunch of different topics by groups, which we call spaces, And that makes it very easy for you to follow topics that are of particular interest to you. And we also do special live streams each week where members can interact and ask questions. You can chat with others, should you choose to do so. And there is a private space for our financial supporters to receive exclusive messages and other perks. Yep, we do that uh, regularly. All right. Hey, when we return, we're going to check out the RV social media buzz. Stay with us. We just heard about a land offering out west for RVers in Arizona. They're selling five-acre RV ranches starting at only $49,900. The company offering it is affiliated with the people Jennifer and I bought our Tennessee property from. They do a great job. It looks amazing. 
It is at high elevation, so you get cooler temperatures, big mountain views, juniper trees, and green grasses. And it is near everything. The Grand Canyon, Lake Havasu, Kingman, Flagstaff, and Sedona. It's a perfect place to have a home base to explore the West, and it is right off famous Route 66. It's called Greenwood Ranches, and this is the second and final section of the community. They're selling it off this April. We met the sales manager, really nice guy. He bought a property for his RV, and he's building a container home on it. Check out their website for a video tour and showing availability. It's pretty incredible. Visit the website to get details and set up a showing, ArizonaRVLand.net. That's ArizonaRVLand.net. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know. Over the years, we've tried many and we have found them all wanting until now. Now, we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-size Aurora Lux medium firm mattress that arrived tightly rolled in a box. All we did was put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. Then we put on the sheets and the bed covers and found we slept so well that we ordered another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. Our sleep is now so luxurious and deep that we can't imagine using a different mattress. Shipping is free. If you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourselves to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Brooklyn Bedding sends out all of their RV mattresses from their own factory in Arizona. This means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you with no middleman bringing up the cost. Don't miss out on the best sleep of your life. Visit rvmattress.com slash RV lifestyle. Welcome back. Time now for the social RV media buzz. And Wendy Boyer reports on the hot issues most talked about this past week on social media and our RV lifestyle community group. Hi, everybody. Over in the RV lifestyle community last week in the general discussion space, Anne asked about a reservation she was about to make in a campground in Illinois. She said when she was looking up the review, someone wrote, watch out for the chiggers. Now, Anne's from California. She's never camped in the part of the country of Illinois in that area. And she started wondering, you know, what should I do? Do I need to change my route? Do I need to camp further north so I can avoid these little bugs? Um, so she asked a group for ideas if anyone had any experience. And well, she got lots of tips. Uh, Suzanne, she grew up in southwest Michigan where the chiggers are. And she said, you know, you're going to be fine just when you go outside, wear long sleeves long pants, tuck your pants into your socks or your boots, spray yourself with bug spray, you should be good. Um, also pack some cameline and some Benadryl in case you get bit to help with the itchiness. Um, Jeff, who grew up in Illinois, where these things are, um, he said that chickers tend to be found in tall grasses and kind of moist, wet areas. And so if she just stays in the regular campground on the manicured lawns, she should be fine. Um, so it was some helpful information there on these little bugs that bite and itch, and hopefully Ann got the information that she needs. Also in the community, in the general discussion space, we had a question from Bernie and Eric, and they asked, does anyone use the the Gas Buddy app. So lots of people did. Um, Les, Brad, Penny, and many others said they found it really helpful when they're traveling down the road and trying to see which place has the best gas prices. Um, Terry and Joe, they said they're good SAM members and they found they get the best prices by going to Flying J's or Pilots where they get a little five to 10 cents off. And then Randall, he says he needs diesel. And so he found Gas Buddy not quite as helpful because he has to fill up about a 100-gallon um, tank. And so he tends to go to where the trucker um, gas stations are. And so he found that TSD Open Roads and Mud Flap were much more helpful for getting the best diesel gas prices. So there was a good conversation there on that one. And then over in our RV Lifestyle Facebook group, Vina, she says she loves the ducks that she sees people leaving on Jeeps and wondered if there is anything like this for people who drive RVs. Now, I had to look this up. 
Um, I knew about the wave that, you know, Jeep drivers have, but I didn't realize for the last couple of years, people have been leaving these ducks, either rubber ducks, toy ducks, stuffed ducks on one another's Jeeps as kind of a friendly in the club, hello sort of thing. Um, and apparently a lot of our viewers who have Jeeps, they even bring bags of ducks with them so that they can leave these ducks on one another's Jeeps. Very interesting. Um, but what was even more interesting to me are so many RV brands have a little thing going on. Um, Joan was many Alliance RV owners who said they leave alligators on one another's rigs. Um, so alligators is kind of a play on alliance and being in the fam, Ali, kind of Ali alligator. Um, and then Monique, she's a Travado owner, and she, she said that people leave bees because Travados are kind of like wannabes as in they wanted a class B. So bees are what's left. Um, Airstream owners, they have something going on there with flamingos. Um, and Greg, he said that he has a Forest River and the Forest River RV Owners Group, acronym FROG, have started leaving frogs on one another's RVs. So who knew? Very interesting. Um, and not everybody, well, a lot of people love this. Not everybody was into it. One man, he cracked me up. He said, hey, the only thing I want being left on my RV is a $100 bill. So to each his own. Um, and that's it for me this week. I'm Wendy Boyer, and I'll see you over in the RV Lifestyle Community or Facebook group. Wow. So I didn't realize, I, I knew with Jeeps about the ducks, but I didn't realize about the frogs and... <laughs> alligators and everything that people are leaving yeah i'm kind of with the i like the idea of the hundred dollar bill I yeah settle for a dollar uh, yeah <laughs> no but that's pretty fun so uh what do you think could we start something with our montana i don't know what do we do with the montana can't put a mountain on somebody's uh <laughs> I don't know. Um, gosh, we need to have a symbol for the Montanas that we have, the fifth wheel that we have. We'll work on that. Uh, maybe somebody will send us a note and tell us what, what maybe they already do something. Nobody just has noticed. They just us. haven't told us. So anyway, I think this is kind of a fun tradition that people have started. It is. All right. When we come back, we are going to talk about a topic that uh, I think is really important. Uh, and it is how to get help on the road when something breaks in your RV and you call the dealer and you might find the dealer is 100 miles away and they can't get you in for two months. What do you do? Well, you look up and find a mobile RV tech. And we are going to talk to a mobile RV tech and learn about how you can find one and uh, what kind of questions to ask before you hire them and uh, why this can really be a big help for you if you're ever stranded on the road someplace. So stay with us. That's coming up in the interview. Right now, I want to talk about uh, being connected on the road. And there's no better place to go than Mobile Must Have. Mobile Must Have is the sponsor of this part of the podcast. And it is a service that is started by RVers for RVers and is dedicated to providing the most needed mobile lifestyle solutions. And this month, Mobile Must Have is offering 30 days of free data with the purchase of a new PepLink router. Now, Mobile Must Have has PepLink routers and internet solutions for every type of RVers, from weekend and holiday vacationers to full-time road warriors and remote workers. And PepLink is the gold standard for mobile internet, and Mobile Must Have has a modem and a data plan that will fit literally every RV budget out there. They offer their Fusion SIM which can provide coverage to every major U.S. carrier. Mobile Must Have also has RV cellular antennas and wiring and cable solutions for Starlink satellite internet. Just go to rvlifestyle.com slash mobile must have. That's rvlifestyle.com slash mobile must have and schedule a free call and free consultation to see the many different internet packages that are available and the one that is just right for you. That's rvlifestyle.com slash mobile must have. Welcome back. Time now for the RV interview of the week. As many of our longtime listeners know, Mike and I are big fans of hiring mobile RV techs. When something goes wrong, mobile techs typically come out right away, do excellent work at a reasonable price. And there are none of those long wait times you hear about at a dealer. 
But one question we often hear is, when you are traveling and something breaks, how do you find a reputable RV tech? And how do you ensure that tech will work with uh, your extended warranty, should you have one? Well, to help us with these questions and more is Jessica Ryder. And Jessica is the owner of uh, Pull Through Sites, which is a mobile tech company. Uh, they serve a 100-mile radius around St. Louis, Missouri. Jessica and her team are RVTI certified technicians. We first uh, met Jessica last fall at the uh, dealer open house in Elkhart, Indiana. And she is here now to give us some very helpful tips on how to find a mobile RV technician for you. Well, Jessica, it's great to have you on the program. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You're getting busy because we're getting on to the spring camping season, right? We are, yeah. I actually just looked at our, our call volume compared to this time last year, and we're up 87%. So 87%. Wow. Yeah. Well, the word is getting out about mobile RV techs, and uh, we have been talking about and singing the praises of them for years now. So let me jump right in and ask you, uh, let's just hypothetically uh, do a quick little thing. You are out on a road trip some someplace, something breaks on your rig in an area that is far from home. You don't know anybody there. How do you find a reputable mobile RV tech? There's three ways that I would look at it. Most of the time, people are going to just get, pull out their phone and they're going to go to Google and they're going to say mobile RV repair near me. Um, and then, you know, whole list will pop up. And those of us that run ads, you know, you'll see all of that. The other two ways that I would recommend is one, if you have the a roadside assistance, call them. They can certainly help try to find somebody for you and they have people in their networks. The other way that I would suggest is if you have an extended warranty, call them as well. One, I always preach to call them and just get the information on, on what's going to, you're going to be responsible for. But two, I know our company is in with several extended warranty companies. And so they may also have a list for you of reputable companies that they have dealt with. That would be a great way to make sure that it is an actual company that you're dealing with and not necessarily just a, a specific individual. I know there are sometimes it does not matter. Like you, you're broke down, you need it fixed. It doesn't matter who comes out. But when it comes to the extended warranties and things like that, they're going to require an actual company with certain documentation and things like that. So as you call, uh, what sort of information is really needed by that mobile tech? Uh, what what should I know about my RV in particular? Sure. So I always preach the more, the better. If you can tell me the year, make, and model... <laughs> If you can send me your VIN number, usually that's just a photo, uh, obviously everything that's going on with your RV. And I want to know details of like, if you call me and say, Hey, my fridge went out. Okay. When was the last time it was working? Did you notice something happen? Now, where are you plugged in? That kind of thing. If you have an issue and we get these a lot, uh, a brake issue or a leaf spring issue, something like that. I always tell people, we preach to our customers and anybody in our network to just have a piece of paper somewhere in your tow vehicle or in your RV that gives me the capacity weight ratings, which it's also on your RV, but just in case you want to keep it separate of your, like the weight, right? So if you're calling me, you're in a, an emergency situation and you need leaf springs, I'm going to ask you what your, do you know what your axles are rated to, to carry, right? Because I then want to see in my network where I have those leaf springs and how quickly I can get them to you. And an easy place to send people, of course, is the little side column, usually inside the driver door, there's a sticker and they can find it there. Yep. But having it written down or even put on your smartphone in notes yeah. or something is a good idea. Exactly. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, there are those who are techs who are certified, then there's the the, the neighborhood mechanic. Uh, when you call for a mobile tech, which 
are there any questions that we ought to ask them that would maybe give us red flags or green flags in, in knowing that they're going to be able to come out and fix us? So uh, here's the the beauty of the industry, right? Um, we, our company is completely certified through the RV Technical Institute, which is the gold standard through the RV industry. There's a, several other schools out there. There's guys that have been turning a wrench for 35 years, and now they do this. Education-wise, we probably all know roughly the same thing. But if you're looking for somebody that has the certifications behind them, then I would certainly ask when you call, hey, do, do you have certifications? Most of these mobile people, if they have a website, it's on their website. I know it, you know, it is for us. It is for several of, of uh, my colleagues here in our area that are certified, have gone to the extra schooling, do the continuing education, all of that kind of stuff. I would just simply ask, you know, are, are you certified? Are you a legitimate business? Um, what other, what experience do you have? That's a good what one. What experience do you have? Uh, how do you take payment? That's yeah. important because some people will only take cash. Some people won't take out-of-state checks. You know, the credit card obviously is the easiest, but not everybody takes that. There's fees involved. So you just asking some of those basic questions when you're traveling through is really important. One thing that I always wonder about is is the parts. Um, if they're on their own and you need a new water pump, for example, or uh, anything you ought to ask them about where they get their parts or how what parts they have on stock, what, what kind of questions do you ask them? Sure. You can absolutely ask them that. I would say nine times out of 10, they're not going to have a whole lot of parts in stock. I know we don't keep a whole lot of parts in stock. Every RV is different. There's what, nine different types of refrigerators now that are going in these RVs. And so keeping what we need, you know, we have the basics, we have the little things. I would ask what their network looks like. So are there local dealerships they buy parts from? For us, we buy from local dealerships if I need to. We buy just like the dealerships do through distribution, through the industry, which typically means I can get parts next day. Um, but then I also have some local trailer companies that I work with that don't do anything in RV, but work trailer axles and brakes and things like that. So I have those relationships that I can go get brakes and axles and uh, leaf springs and things like that. I mean, I'll tell you, one of our very first calls was someone that needed a whole new axle on their RV. And I couldn't get one from an industry company by the time these people left, I had five days to get them an axle. And I just started using my network and I found a trailer company here locally to me that custom built them an axle. Really? And had it when we put it on in five days. Wow. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's encouraging to know that that kind of stuff can be done. Now, uh, oftentimes you can buy these parts on Amazon. Any, any red flags about that? Can you buy the, is it okay to buy these parts on Amazon? Sometimes it is. Here's what I will say. You really need to watch the part numbers. And even if somebody says, hey, it's universal, you got to be very skeptical about that because it's sometimes it's really not universal. Um, what we do is most parts in the RV industry, you know, they have a two or three year lifetime on them as far as when these companies are discontinuing them and coming out with new ones. So I always look at, okay, what is the direct replacement? And I will call a Lippert, a Dometic or whoever and say, what is my replacement part number? And then if you want to go find that exact part number on Amazon, then by all means do that. Um, but I would not just get on and, and say, oh, okay, this, this says it's universal or how many times have all of us been like, we click on the sponsored link instead of the actual link. And here we go buy a part that we thought it said it was this, but it really wasn't. Yeah. That's the we're in a panic, that. right? We're in a panic. Oh my gosh, I need this. My RV's broke and we don't pay attention to the actual stuff. On, on the other hand, you can get those parts sometimes quicker through Amazon absolutely too. You yeah. can. You absolutely yeah. can. And I always just say, make sure if you're going to buy on Amazon or some one of these other companies, just please make sure your part numbers are the right. 
All right, so let's uh, talk about the actual work that is done. One of the things in the dealership is, you know, they've been around. You can go to the dealership if it's if it didn't work. Um, the RV tech may be across the county the next day, and you find it didn't work. What questions should you ask, or what assurances should you get from the tech about the work that they perform? So, I like to ask, and people do ask us what if this doesn't work? What happens? And Mike, to be perfectly honest, when I started my company, it was, yes, I'm a business and need to make money like every other business, but we started our company to serve consumers. So if something were to happen, we change out a part, it works for, you know, overnight here, they get up, they leave the next day and they're in Arizona two days later. And now all of a sudden it's not working again. It's that customer service and that relationship that is very important to me. And so I'll say, okay, how do we get this corrected for this customer and find them somebody that can take care of it when they're in Arizona? I'm not going to say that every person's going to do that. Some people will fix it and move on. And if it breaks, that's on you and you better find somebody else. So I would ask, hey, what if I have problems down the road with this? Do, is there a warranty or anything like that? I'll be perfectly honest and say that I don't always warranty the parts or the work or anything like that. Some of the parts that we get, depending on how big it is, they, it comes with a warranty. It might have a 30 or 60 day warranty yeah. on it. So you can certainly ask the technician that, hey, did this part come with a warranty? That way, you know, with your records, hey, I can call this technician back and say, this part's not working. You said it had a 30-day warranty. I'm within that window. What do we need to do? Talking about warranties, what about manufacturer's warranties? Uh, you break down. You don't have time to get uh, take it to the uh, uh, dealership. Uh, do mobile techs work with, with uh, manufacturer's warranties? Some do. Some don't. Uh, we specifically do. Because again, that is what serves the RV consumer at the highest level. And so it really depends on the technician. So you would have just have to ask when you call, hey, I have an extended warranty or I just bought this in 2023. So I'm still covered under my manufacturer warranty. Anytime somebody calls that has a 2023, I always ask, you're still probably covered under manufacturer warranty. Even a 2022, uh, you, in, in, you probably could go back to 2021 at this point, um, there will be some manufacturers that will cover a three-year chassis, you know, three-year frame, uh, two years on some parts. I'm swapping out a Furion tankless water heater right now that's got a two-year warranty on it. So that all goes back to the manufacturer uh, and not through an extended warranty. So you just have to ask the technician, do you deal with warranty? There's more paperwork involved. It's slower pay. So a lot of technicians won't do it. I, I can see why. I can see why. Yeah. And extended warranties, I would assume, assume it's the same same basic thing. You yeah. Ask ahead of time. So you ask know what you're doing. ahead of time. And I would say if, you're, if you have an extended warranty, you break down. Your uh, AC goes out, right? Um, call your extended warranty first and ask them what they cover. Ask them what your deductible is. You might have a hundred dollar deductible. Ask them if the service call fee for a technician is covered. Some cover the full thing. Some cover 50%. Some won't cover it at all. So that way, when you call the technician, you know up front, okay, what's your service call? If it's $200 and your extended warranty won't cover any of it, you know, you're already out $200 when that person shows up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious now, uh, what's the most common things people are calling you about right now as we start a new season? So right now we're doing all of the big stuff before the season starts, right? So we're putting on new awnings, we're greasing bearings, uh, we're changing out brakes. We are doing all of those things before the season gets here. All those like honey to do list things that people are like, oh, shoot, I should probably get this done before I want to start camping. Um, in the winter months here, we deal with furnaces all the time. And then in the summer, we're dealing with ACs. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, wheel bearings. How, how often should those be replaced in an RV? When 
when should somebody do that? So we say that we should, you should grease those like every year or two, at least get them checked. You know, our maintenance that we go through with people, you know, we like to look at those at least once a year. Um, I think, I believe the rating, you know, there's like 5,000 miles or something. Um, it really, it depends on where you're going and what you're doing. You know, how, if you're taking a lot of weekend trips and you go seven times a year, you can, you could probably get away with maybe closer to two years, but you should definitely get them checked. All right. So tell us about your company and the area you serve a little bit, uh, Jessica, and how people can reach you. Yeah. So our company is called Pull Through Sites. It's named that way because a pull through site is the easiest way, easiest uh, campground to pull into campsite. And that we want to make repair easy. And uh, so we serve the St. Louis area. We do a hundred mile radius around St. Louis. We get a lot of people that are traveling through. Uh, most people don't think that, you know, St. Louis is a gateway, but it really is a gateway. Um, everybody coming from the North, going down to Texas or Florida or East to West, every, most of the time people come through St. Louis. So we have a unique relationship with a local campground that um, we are a preferred vendor for them. So if people have repairs and they need to come through, um, they can certainly give us a call and actually stay at this campground and, and we'll put them on a priority list to have them come over, uh, our team come over and, and take a look at the stuff. So, And how do we reach you? What's so, your website? Website is our company name, pullthroughsites.com and through is T-H-R-O-U-G-H. Um, everything is on there. All of our contact information, we are, um, we are campers ourselves. We know that campers do not camp Monday through Friday, eight to five. So we are available in the evenings and weekends to answer questions and help, help you get through. Even if it's just a quick I'm not sure that I understand how to do this, but I know I can do the work myself. We answer those kind of questions all the time because if I can save you the money because you just need to look at a fuse or flip a switch, I'd rather do that. Well, Jessica, it's been a delight talking to you and getting these tips for people, especially now as they start to head out. Uh, we will link, uh, for those of you who are driving, uh, listening to the podcast, don't worry, go to our show notes page at rvlifestyle.com and in the description, we'll have a link to uh, everything Jessica was talking about, uh, or again, directly to her site, which is pretty easy to remember, pullthroughsites.com. Jessica, you've been a delightful guest and we'll have you back on again if it's okay with you. That works for me. Thank you, Mike. All right. Well, it is so encouraging uh, to see more and more mobile RV techs coming on the scene, isn't it? Oh, it really is. I, I can't say how many times that we've needed one and used them, and we've been happy. I mean, I even use them at home, and uh, instead of having to hook up the fifth wheel and take it to a dealership, uh, I just call, and they're there usually the same day. And if you give them a bunch of information on your RV and your VIN number, they can be prepared, as Jessica uh, told us, to... Uh, be able to treat you very efficiently and uh, fix and get you back on the road. I use them for winterizing and um, they're just they're just so helpful. We've been using RV techs for years and I'm glad to see more and more of them coming on the scene. Me too. All right, news of the week is coming up right after this. Jennifer and I bought some land near Nashville, Tennessee a while back. We got tired of crowded, expensive campgrounds and worrying about reservations. Tennessee is a gorgeous state with friendly people, and it has been such a pleasure. Coming up on April 13th, the same developer has some new property near us close to the Natchez Trace and Buffalo River called The Reserve at High Forest. Big properties, 5 to 41 acres. You can build a house, a cabin, or RV year-round. Prices start at only $89,900. Your property, your way, 100% ownership. The scenery in this part of Tennessee is breathtaking, and the property is gorgeous. Garden, landscape, bring your pets, build what you want. There's high-speed fiber optic internet, and it is so private. A great place to make your home base ready whenever you want it. They're selling these on April 13th by appointment, five to 41 acre properties from $89,900. There's even great financing. Check out the site and a video tour at rvlands.net. That's rvlands.net. 
Welcome back. Time now for the RV News of the Week, and you've got our lead story. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed more and more National Park Service, service sites are going cashless, requiring visitors to pay entrance fees with Apple Pay, credit cards, or debit card? It is a growing trend, and earlier this month, three people decided to sue the National Park Service over it. The lawsuit says prohibiting people from entering government-owned land if all they have is government-issued currency is not only unreasonable, but an abuse of federal law. Plus, they say credit cards have many fees associated with them, which ultimately costs the taxpayer. Now... In the past, the National Park Service has said that it is going cashless like this because it improves efficiency. Uh, But the lawsuit shows uh, that the hurdles those who want to pay cash uh, or only have cash face when trying to enter a cashless national park site, they're pretty substantial. For example, one woman was told to go to a, a big grocery store chain like Walmart get a credit card, and then come to the National Park site and use that for payment. Now, a lot of people don't like credit cards. They don't like having debt. And for that reason, they don't have one. And they're being penalized by this, uh, people in the lawsuit would allege. Another woman who wanted to visit the cashless Saguaro National Park, was, was listen to this. she was told to stop first at a different national park in Arizona that does accept cash and then buy an interagency pass and then come back to Seguro using that pass to enter. That's ridiculous. And some locations we saw that are already cashless or soon will be include Mount Rainier, Death Valley, Rocky Mountain, Badlands, the Cumberland Island National Seashore, and many more. It's going to be interesting to see where all this goes. Yes, it is. Speaking of national parks, Utah's Zion National Park is considering major construction changes near the Very busy south entrance there. Um, They're hoping that uh, they can get a significant overhaul uh, to improve safety and this massive congestion that uh, arrives every day during the summer. Uh, They say that the construction, though, could significantly significantly impact visitors uh, this year and even next year. About 70% of the nearly 5 million annual visitors at Zion enter through that south entrance and you know how crowded it is. Yeah, and it, contribute, it contributes to accidents and shuttle delays. And uh, they think the solution is a major redo, which would include building a pedestrian and vehicle bridge, expanding parking, realigning the roads, building two roundabouts. Roundabouts, yeah. Well, the park is taking public comments on this plan until April 10th. And if it's approved... Construction would start in the fall, and it would not finish until sometime in 2026. If you haven't been to Zion, by the way, this summer may be the time to go because it looks like it's going to have some potential uh, construction delays uh, starting next year. And Zion is a park that we highly recommend uh, visiting, and we wrote all about it and other parks in Utah in our um, Southern Utah RV Adventure Guide. And you can find that at rvlifestyle.com slash books. A tornado struck down in Kentucky near the uh, southern Indiana border and in Ohio, killing at least three, injuring dozens, and destroying many buildings in a severe storm system that hit the area last week. But the image that was making the rounds in RV groups, including ours, was of the Sandy Beach campground and a nearby RV park where many RVs were flattened moved many feet from where they originally were parked, turned to their sides, and some shredded by the twister. And one RV showed a TV station reporter what was left of her completely demolished RV. The awning was ripped into strips. Some of it dangled in a tree, wrapped around its upper branches. Other parts of the awning torn into strips of laying in an area many football fields wide. Tornadoes are one of the most frightening thoughts for RVers. Okay, and we've got some ideas on how you can be prepared. And what we'll do is we'll put a description of that uh, below. So you can uh, click to an article we wrote on how to be prepared during tornado season in areas that are prone to tornadoes. Well, the guy who played James Bond (laughs) pled guilty 
the going uh, off trail in Yellowstone National Park in a thermal area. We're talking about uh, actor Pierce Bronson, uh, who was one of the James Bonds, and uh, he pled guilty. Uh, and what happened is uh, he ended up being fined uh, fifteen hundred bucks, and he was spotted in this area in November. He pled not guilty in January, and then he pled guilty last week to the violation. So he went on Instagram and he said that he's an environmentalist uh, and he made an impulsive mistake. He went into the thermal area that was covered in snow at the time and he wanted to take a picture and he said he didn't see the no trespassing sign. Um, Yellowstone is pretty clear that visitors have to stay on trails, do not stray off trails, especially in thermal areas. Besides damaging the delicate ground, it's very dangerous, and some have suffered severe burns, even death. Uh, remember last year we interviewed a Yellowstone ranger um, on our podcast here about all of the foolish things visitors do, and they continue to increase. So just pay attention to the signs if you're at Yellowstone. Somehow, always, some people think that doesn't apply to them. They're not going to hurt anything. Yeah or that nobody's looking and right. I'm just going to go get that picture. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's you know, it, they're dangerous. They really are, these areas. I, I fear that they're going to just fence off almost all of it. And like those boardwalks that you can walk and get relatively close to everything, that they're going to seal those off because people just don't seem to stay on them. Yeah, people just can't follow the rules. No, it's crazy. I guess it's always been like that, but it I just seems worse now. Like it's a, a me first. Me first. You me got first. It. Yeah. Okay. Now it's you first because when we come back, we're answering your RV questions. So stay with us. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free, and battle-borne batteries are protected by a 10-year guarantee. Now in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have, and they'll probably be the same on your rig too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Time now for the RV questions of the week. And we want to remind you that we love getting your questions or your comments. And if you want to comment on anything you've heard in this week's uh, podcast, or if you have a question you'd like us to answer, you can use our personal email. Just send it to us at Mike and Jen at RVlifestyle.com. Here's our question this week. We just got our first travel trailer and I'm looking for any tips, advice on how to, if possible, mount anything from towel hooks, small shelves, and decor to the uh, trailer's vinyl wall covering. And that's Jamie. All right. Well, Jamie, um, first, I guess we want to tell you to be careful of putting towels or anything that could possibly be flammable near your RV burners or your cooktop. top. This came from our RV lifestyle community and she showed a, a picture and it was right above the burners. And that is not where you want to put towels because if uh, uh, your your burners are, are, the flame gets too high, they could easily start, start those towels on fire. Uh, so be careful of that. Um, in our RVs, we use, um, what do you call those little hooks? Uh, command hooks to hang clothes. Uh, we've got them in the bathroom. We've got them in the bedroom. Uh, and we um, also uh, do some other things that, we want to hang up things like uh, spice racks and towel holders and items. For that, we use a sticky-sided industrial strength uh, hook and loop tape. And you, we get that at Amazon. We'll put a link in the description. Uh, but it comes in a 30-foot roll. And the tape's about an inch wide. And you can easily cut it to the whatever length you want with a pair of scissors. So one side is the hook and one side is, you know, is the, uh, is the loop and you have to cut two lengths of that. One goes on the wall, 
and the other goes on whatever it is you're trying to hang. Um, they hold about one pound per inch, which is pretty good. And the tape, when you do take it off, it doesn't leave any residue, uh, which is very good. Uh, but you know, you shouldn't take it off and then reuse it. Uh, cut off another couple lengths if you're going to reattach your item. Uh, it sticks to pretty much all surfaces, uh, walls, glass, tile, plastic, metal, textile, wood. Now for photos, which we have throughout our RV, and if you've watched any of our videos and we've shot them inside our RVs, you've seen these pictures are all over the walls. We just love having these pictures on our walls. They're the ones we use, our memories from our trips. Um, and we use a product called Mix Tiles. I have no connection we have no connection at all with this company, but we've just used these for years and we love them. Uh, what we do is we go to the company's website and we upload photos that we have taken with our smartphones that we want to put have printed up. And then we pick a frame size that we want and they send us back perfectly framed uh, prints of the pictures that we sent. Uh, the frames have a, a sticky tape on them, kind of like that command strip, but it's it's really effective. It's a, it's very sticky. Uh, even when we're on very bumpy drives, they, they just don't fall off. And you can get those frames in different colors, like white and black, I think mm -hmm. they have. Um, you can get just blank frames uh, made by the same company if you want to display photos that you already have printed, and you can get those from Amazon. Um, they come in 8x8 eight eight sizes. Uh, a few of them are 12x12. 12 12. I think they've even got bigger ones as well. And we have an assortment of them, as I say, throughout our RV. So we'll put links to all the stuff in the description and you can check that out. Well, that's it for this week. We hope that you have enjoyed the podcast. We hope that uh, spring truly has sprung in your area as well. And uh, we invite you to stay in touch with us. Uh, we are always available, it seems. Uh, we're checking in constantly at our RV Lifestyle community, which is community.rvlifestyle.com. And you can reach us through our personal email and send us questions or comments at Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Till next week. Happy trails.